Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Hello, my name is Stephanie Fassler and I am the International Affairs Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this author series program. Many thanks to our strategic partners at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for, making this one, for their wonderful hospitality and making this available for our event space. Our programs are filmed for broad, nationwide broadcast for a one-hour weekly television show, World Affairs Today, which airs Sundays at 3 p.m. on MHC Network's Worldview channel. They are also distributed globally on YouTube after broadcast. We welcome to our po podium Dr. Aman Hingarani, author of Unraveling the Kashmir Knot. Kashmir is an 86,000 square mile region in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent. Since the British partition of the subcontinent in 1947, India and Pakistan have both laid claim to the Kashmir territory, with China also occupying an area of Kashmir after a border war with India in 1962. Since the initial Indo-Pakistani War of 1947 over Kashmir, there have been two others over the territory, the Indo-Pakistani Wars in 1965 and 1999. In 1947, which is known as the First Kashmir War, began when Pakistan feared that the Maharaja of Kashmir and Jammu would accede to India. The war ended in a 1949 ceasefire brokered by the United Nations, which established a line of control. A promised referendum to determine Kashmir's accession was never held. The War of 1965 started following Pakistan's Operation of Gibraltar, in which Pakistani forces sent, it, sent to infiltrate Kashmir to precipitate an insurgency against the rule of India. India retaliated by crossing an international border and launching a military attack near Lahore, Pakistan. During the war of 1999, Pakistani troops infiltrated again across the line of control and occupied Indian territory. India responded by launching a major military and diplomatic offensive to drive out the Pakistani infiltrators. The separatist violence has killed more than 47,000 people in Kashmir. This does not include people who have disappeared due to the conflict. Kashmir has remained an obstacle to better relations for the last 60 years between the two nuclear-armed countries of India and Pakistan. Repercussions of these events lead us to wonder, how can this conflict be addressed? What can be done to resolve the situation and bring stability to the region? Tonight, our distinguished author, Dr. Aman Hingarani, will discuss the present Kashmir conflict and its potential path to peace. He is a lawyer and mediator in the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Delhi. Dr. Hingarani has taught in programs at various institutes in India and abroad, including the National Judi Judicial Academy, University of Delhi, Indian Law Institute, University of Oxford, and Warwick University. He has prepared curriculum for a variety of law courses across the world, <clears throat> such as the Indo-British Project on Advocacy Skills Training and the Alternative Dispute Resolution Materials of the All India Bar Examination and the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. He has over 28 publications to his name, with his books focused on national and international topics, on varied subjects ranging from intellectual property protection to the dynamics of global missile proliferation. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Aman Hingarani. Thank you, Stephanie. Let me start by thanking all of you for coming. Uh, I intend to speak for about half an hour, <coughs> for about half an hour and then uh, open the floor for discussion. I, uh, I've written on Kashmir issue more by accident. I was in search of a topic for my doctoral research. I've done doctorate in law. And 
this was one area which was suggested where every conceivable principle of law has been turned on its head to create and sustain this issue. Stephanie has given the popular discourse on Kashmir. My book challenges that discourse. I have researched on this topic since 1995. Almost, the book came out 20 years later. And I have relied primarily on British archives to show that the partition of the subcontinent, as well as the Kashmir issue, was actually scripted by the British. It's not that I'm not the one saying so, it is the British archives that say so. So let us start the story from the beginning. Those of you who are familiar with the subcontinent would know that the East India Company, a trading company, came eastwards with the sanction of the Queen of England. The charter was of 1600. By 1608, the East India Company had made a transit point, trade transit point, on the western coast of, coast of India. Over the years, the company became a territorial power. And if we fast forward straight to 1857, that was when there was the first war of independence as far as the Indians are concerned, or the mutiny as the British viewed it. That led to the British crown taking over the subcontinent. You had few events of 1858 which are important. First, you had the British Parliament enacting laws, the Government of India Act of 1858, conceptualizing a constitutional framework by which you had a viceroy on the subcontinent and a secretary of state sitting in London, typically a member of the British cabinet, and they would govern the subcontinent, a unitary form of government. The Queen of England also made a proclamation in 1858 that we do not wish to annex any more territory. At that time, about 45% of the subcontinent was still not annexed. And there were basically about 560-odd princely Indian states. Each had a monarchy. I mean, there was a ruler in each state who, which, who was sovereign. And the British Queen said, we'll be satisfied if these rulers gave their external allegiance to the British crown. Internally, they can remain sovereign. And the British generally did not also interfere with those states, except in matters of succession, etc. So as of 1858, there were two kinds of territories under the control of the British. One, the British provinces. So if you see the map, Uh, if we dim the lights, maybe it will be slightly more visible. The dark portions were are the princely Indian states, and the light portions are the British provinces. So you had the British provinces, which were governed directly by British laws, and the princely Indian states were still ruled by the rulers, owing external sovereignty to the British crown. Internally, they were sovereign. If you see the geostrategic location of the subcontinent, you have Iran, Afghanistan, you'll see USSR right on the top, China, Tibet, and of course, that was the entire subcontinent uh, uh, before, the, before the subcontinent was partitioned in 1947. Now, with the 1857 War of Independence, the Muslims on the subcontinent realized that they must remain united with the Hindus so as to act against the common enemy, the British. The British, on their part, had to do, try to do everything they could to break this unity. I've gone through the telegrams between the Viceroy and the Secretary of State, and they reveal the official British policy that we must communalize the subcontinent. There's a difference between religious persecution, say, of one community under 
the Mughal rule and communalizing the polity as a whole. The official British policy was we need, we did not create the Hindu Muslim differences, but we must sharpen them to such an extent that only we, the British, can remain the composers and thereby stay on the subcontinent. This was the official British policy as documented in the exchange of telegrams. And if we see some telegrams, notably of 21st September 1922, where the Viceroy is reporting to the Secretary of State that the break between Hindu Muslims is almost complete. Again, on 1st January 1925, where the Viceroy says, well, whatever bridge Gandhi is trying to build between Hindu and Muslims, we have managed to break it. So you had a situation where the community was being polarized. The entire polity was being polarized between Hindus and Muslims as a matter of state policy. This assumed a different dimension altogether when the World War II broke out. The Indian National Congress, which had been set up in 1885 to spearhead the freedom movement, had made a demand to tell the, they told the British, please leave the subcontinent and we want to have nothing to do with you, nothing to be in the British Commonwealth. You just have to vacate. The British knew that they would soon have to transfer power. But the British chief of staffs have put on record that they cannot afford to lose control of the entire subcontinent. And there was a reason for that. The reason for that is that at that time, the precursor of the Cold War, the great game was being played out between Britain and Soviet Russia. The British did not want Soviet Russian influence to come southwards towards the Middle East, the oil. And the British used many strategies to keep the Russians at, at bay. One of the strategy was to use Islam as an ideological boundary. And if we see again, uh, the Soviet Union, you can see up there, you will see there's Islamic belt from Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, the Northwest frontier province of the subcontinent, China. There's Islamic belt. And this was the ideological boundary to keep Russian influence from coming southwards towards the Middle East. The British strategists, and it's all documented, have gone on record to say, for us, if we have to leave the subcontinent, we must keep a slice of India. And the slice of India is the Northwest frontier region, which is now Pakistan. We must have a friendly state out there, because otherwise we cannot complete this Islamic crescent. The British archives document the exchange of telegrams say, on 12th of March 1940, where the Viceroy is telling the Secretary of State, I've already asked Zafrullah Khan, a member of my council, to draw up the maps of India and Pakistan. This is 1940. When Glancy, the British governor, said, don't create Pakistan, there's no internal geographical boundary. There will be warfare for centuries here. There'll be bloodshed on the subcontinent. But the policy continued from London to create Pakistan. Pakistan was a creation of the British for its great game against Soviet Russia. And this is as per British archives, where the chief of staffs have documented all these facts. The British enunciated many plans, the Stafford Crisp plan, the cabinet mission plan, all which contemplated fracturing the subcontinent, much against the US wishes. US was worried it will balkanize India and get commu the communists to come in. So they, they didn't want a fractured subcontinent. But Britain had decided to go ahead. They passed these plans. When that did not work, there was a call by the Muslim League. Muslim League had been created in 1906, immediately after the Prince of Wales, later the King of England, had visited India and had told his viceroy, Congress is becoming a power, the International Congress, do something about it. 
1906, a Muslim Congress takes birth, the Muslim League. The Muslim League was created to, was propped up by the British to counter the influence of the Indian National Congress. And so if you see this telegram of 12th March 1940, sent by the Viceroy to the Secretary of State saying, the two nation theory, the maps, the whole concept of India-Pakistan has been communicated to the Muslim League. And on 10 days later, 22nd March 1940, Jinnah from Muslim League announces the two nation theory from Lahore. Two nation theory itself was formulated by the British which basically said Hindu Muslims cannot stay in one country. Gandhi said that's an untruth. Why two nations? You have Christians, Sikhs, Parsis. Why not five nations? It just didn't make sense. In America, you may be Christians, Muslims, Hindus. You're American Christians, American Hindus, American Muslims. You're still American. Religion cannot be the test of nationhood. So that was the reasoning that this entire th principle is an untruth. But the British had decided to use religion as a basis of partitioning the subcontinent because they wanted to create the friendly state, Pakistan. Now, when this does not really work, the Muslim, the British went ahead with a plan of partition. End of December, 19, uh, end of uh, 1945, the British created the blueprint of partition, which was communicated in a telegram in 1946, February 1946. Uh, this, the date of that is, um, I'm sorry, I don't, it's in the book somewhere. This was of February 1946. The Viceroy communicates the blueprint of partition to the Secretary of State. In July 1946, Muslim League declares direct action, that is communal killings. We started from Bengal. The British troops went into the barracks. The field was open for killings. We slowly started engulfed all over the country. The direct action day was 18th of August 1946. The orgy of violence led to the Congress, Indian National Congress accepting partition so on 3rd of June, 1947, the British announced a political agreement that we will be partitioning the subcontinent. The provinces of Punjab and Bengal will be partitioned. Punjab had to, to be partitioned because the Northwest Frontier Province, if you go back to the, uh, the map, if you see uh, Baluchistan, Northwest Frontier Province um, is right next to Kashmir. That is all hilly area. To make that West Pakistan, it was then West Pakistan viable, Punjab, the fertile land of Punjab had to be given to West Pakistan. And that's the reason why Punjab had to be partitioned. By the logic of that argument, Bengal was partitioned. Rest of the provinces were with India. For Northwest Frontier Province, that was ruled by the Cong Indian National Congress because Gandhi had supported the Khilafat movement and it was 100% Muslim, no scope of divide and rule. This book documents the smoke screens created by the British to force the Indian National Congress to hold a referendum in Northwest Frontier Province and to abstain from uh, voting in that referendum so that Pakistan can materialize. So you had a political agreement, referendum in one province, partition of two provinces. But crucially, this political agreement talked about that as far as the princely Indian states are concerned, Kashmir is a princely Indian state. As far as the princely Indian states are concerned, the sovereignty or the paramountcy would lapse. It will be reverted to the ruler. So ruler becomes sovereign. So what was contemplated was about 560 independent sovereign countries on the subcontinent. Now this political agreement was crystallized in law, British law, passed by British parliament. The prevailing Government of India Act 1935, a British statute was amended. 
Indian Independence Act 1947 was enacted by the British Parliament, which talked about dominance of India and Pakistan being created, who could pass laws repugnant to the laws of England, and reflecting this political agreement. Now, that was the plan or partition of the subcontinent in this entire scheme or scripting partition. The British assumed that Jammu and Kashmir, if you see right at the top, Muslim majority contiguous to Pakistan would accede to Pakistan, or at least be within a sphere of influence, a kind of a northern island. And when that did not happen, it is the British which created the Kashmir issue. And how? If you see the official British documents, The, as of 15th August 1947, Kashmir was not part of India. It was a sovereign country. The ruler did not want to come to India or Pakistan. The ruler said, I don't want to go to Pakistan, it's Islamic, but I don't want to go to India because my, the popular leader, Sheikh Abdullah, is very close to Nehru, the first prime minister of India. The ruler had got Nehru arrested in 1946, and he knew he would be a figurehead. Nehru had said, well, excellencies don't count in the new mood of India. And so he knew he would be a figurehead, so he didn't, did not want to go to India. Pakistan, to persuade the ruler to come to Pakistan, has started tribal invasions, which the ruler documented in letters to the King of England, because India, Pakistan was still dominions. The king was still the constitutional head. So those correspondences are there. That tribal invasion, in a way, boomeranged with the ruler acceding to India on 26 October 1947, unconditionally in three areas, external affairs, defense, communications so as to make that state an integral part of India. Now that could have been fatal for the British. It defeated the very purpose of partition because if you see the map, you'll see USSR and Afghanistan, there's a very thin line of territory which separates Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir from USSR. If you see, we can see another map. If you see, there is USSR, thin line of Afghanistan, and then the northern areas. The, the northwest frontier province and the northern areas were the areas that fell within the Islamic crescent from Turkey to China. So this could defeat the very rational partition. But the British did not need the entire state. Kashmir, the state, exceeded on 26 October 1947. Five days later, on 31st October 1947, the British Gilgit scouts, led by British officers, took into custody the governor of the ruler, hoisted Pakistani flag on what was then Indian territory, rang up to telegram Peshawar and said, take it over. So it's a British who carved out the northern areas in a coup five days after the accession and handed it over to Pakistan. At that time being dominant, the Indian and Pakistan armies were headed by British officers and they felt free to draw the lines where they wanted to draw the lines. Mountbatten, the last viceroy, was also the first governor general. And as governor general, he could stop the advance of his own army to recover northern areas. The British officers decided that two areas must be free, kept free from Indian control. One was this northern area. The other was what we say the Azad or free Kashmir or Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which is this narrow strip between Northwest Frontier Province and German Kashmir. Because the logic of the British officers, again documented, was that should India go to war against Pakistan to recover northern areas, 
India will liquidate Pakistan, defeating the purpose of partition. So these two areas were already earmarked in 1947 to be kept free from Indian control. If you go further into the official British documents and if you go back as per what Mountbatten himself says, he says, well, I wanted Kashmir to join Pakistan. And when the ruler sent the instrument of accession, I decided I know how to handle it. I told Nehru that I, as Governor General of India, will not sign on the execution, accession instrument till you first commit to plebiscite. This is Mountbatten's words, which I've documented. The reason for this, or the politics behind this, could be seen when we see the other cases of two other princely Indian states, Junagar and Hyderabad. If we just go back to the previous map, so you have Junagar and Hyderabad in the center of India. Junagar was, had a Muslim ruler, Hindu majority population. Hyderabad had a Muslim ruler, Hindu majority population. Kashmir had a Hindu ruler, Muslim majority population. According to many commentators, the Muslim League, or the or Jinnah to be more precise, laid a trap for the government of India as far as Junagar is concerned. Junagar acceded to Pakistan, a geographical impossibility. India should have kept quiet. But the ruler of Junagar, sitting in Karachi, telegrams the government of India saying, why don't you take over the administration of my state and let the people decide. India did just that. India held a plebiscite and told the world, Junagar is a part of India. Hyderabad, the size of France. Indian army walks in, holds a plebiscite, says Hyderabad is a part of India. Both Junagar Hyderabad questions were taken to the United Nations Security Council. And the stand of Pakistan simply was that Junagar and Hyderabad laid on the proposition then where the rulers of one community, people are of the other, it is a policy of the Indian National Congress that the people will decide. And so for Kashmir, the same policy applies. It is in that background Mountbatten had asked Nehru, I will first commit to plebiscite before I sign on the instrument of accession, accepting the accession. And according to Mountbatten, Nehru agreed, <clears throat> subject to the condition that let the first the tribal invasion, the invaders from Pakistan, because it's not the state which is invading, but it's the tribes from Pakistan which are invading, let they vacate and then we'll have a plebiscite. And Mountbatten said, I agree to that. But then that did not help Pakistan. Kashmir was sovereign. India was sovereign. One sovereign country exceeds to another sovereign country. In international law, a third sovereign country has no standing to veto that accession. It's either the ruler who says that accession is bad for fraud or violence, or New Delhi who says it, a third country can't say it. And this reference to the people of plebiscite was a promise made by New Delhi to a section of population within India. So it's within India's domestic jurisdiction. So if you go through the British documents, which again I've documented, Mountbatten kept persuading Nehru, why don't you involve the United Nations Security Council to stop the fighting? Why don't you go to the United Nations they will support you. I've documented the several occasions in which Nehru himself says, I was pressured by Mountbatten, persuaded by Mountbatten to involve the UNO. The strategy of the British was very simple. At that time, there was a provision of, under the League of Nations, the notion of provisional orders. Whenever there's fighting, the League of Nations used to say, immediate ceasefire without requiring the aggressor to vacate. And so the aggressor had de facto control. 
Should the victim then want to recover the territory, the victim would become paradoxically the aggressor. The strategy was, we have to keep those two territories free from Indian control. We need to take the Kashmir question or the reference to the people outside India's domestic jurisdiction. We go to the United Nations, we persuade India to go to the United Nations. In United Nations, the United Nations Security Council will say immediate ceasefire without requiring Pakistan to vacate. Thereby, Pakistan gets de facto control of these two areas and makes it available to the British for the great game against Russia. And that's precisely what happened. I've documented how the entire proceedings before the United Nations Security Council were scripted how the British officers from the subcontinent came to the US, when they spoke to Austin, briefed him what he had to say. All that is documented by the British in their archives. Now, with the United Nations Security Council passing resolutions for plebiscite, as far as India is concerned, they figured out they've been taken for a ride. So, there's a secret telegram from Nehru to Sheikh Abdullah, the popular leader in Kashmir, saying, four years ago, I gave up the idea of plebiscite, 1948 itself. War is not a option. And so I've come across to the view that let them keep what they have, we keep what we have. And that proposal to partition Kashmir finds mention in the UN yearbook of 1950. Now, that's officially India's policy is the entire state belongs to us. There's a parliament resolution to that effect. But the Kashmir issue really is stopping Pakistan from have, doing cross-border terrorism. As far as India is concerned, they say we are released from UN resolutions because Pakistan has never vacated. There have been change of circumstances, cross-border terrorism, etc. So we are released from the UN resolutions of plebiscite. As far as the unofficial policy of New Delhi is, which is reflected in Shimla Agreement, Law Declaration, right up till 2017, is let them keep what they have, we keep what we have. Territorial status quo. There's one tiny sna snag in that. Indian policymakers don't seem to realize that Indian constitution does not permit the Indian state to cede national territory, like the US. In India, like the US, we have a controlled constitution, where the constitution puts constitutional limitations on the powers of every organ of the state, executive, legislature, judiciary. Our constitution, it is the people are popular sovereign, constitution is a legal sovereign. The state gets the power from the constitution. And the Supreme Court, Indian Supreme Court, has held in no uncertain terms that parliament, which is maybe supreme within a sphere, is subject to the constitutional limitation that it cannot amend the constitution so as to affect its basic structure. Territorial integrity, unity of the country has been listed as basic structure. And so, while under general law, a sovereign country can acquire territory or can give away territory. In India, our country can't. The constitution prohibits it. So India's policy, right up to 2017, of converting line of control into the international border, disowning its territory and its people, which have been occupied by Pakistan, is actually against the constitution. We are barking up the wrong tree for the last 70 years. Meanwhile, India discovers from Chinese maps in 1957 that China has occupied Aksai Chin, one portion of Kashmir. If you go back to this, you'll see Aksai Chin is on the extreme right. Actually, if you see this map, the extreme red corner has been occupied by China. We discovered it in 1957 through Chinese maps that in early 1950s, China built a road connecting his province, Xinjiang province, to Tibet. 
the other portion was an area ceded by Ch Pakistan. Pakistan gifted Indian territory to China in 1963. And since we have the policy of territorial status quo, we had only formal protest because we didn't really care. Not only didn't we really care, India went to war against Pakistan. We had the 1965 wars, as Stephanie pointed out. Indian forces recovered Haji Pir, from where the militants even today come. Indian territory, as per constitution of India, not Pakistan territory, as per Pakistan's constitution. But at Tashkent, India handed over Indian territory back to Pakistan because of territorial status quo. Somebody from Pakistan occupied Kashmir falls into the river Jhelum, comes on this side, constitutionally an Indian citizen. Indian army will pick her up and hand her over back to Pakistan army. Because the policy is itself misconceived. Now, it is in this background, or rather before I come to that, if we just see the role of China, you'll see that now what China has done is is built the economic corridor, one belt, one road initiative through Gilgit Baltistan. The entire CPEC is conceived through occupied territory of Kashmir. But because we want a formal, we just have a formal protest because we don't really care. At one level, I mean, my instinct, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but I can speculate why Indian policymakers are not very uh, keen on moving for injunction or restraining China is because they feel perhaps China will force Pakistan to partition the state. China wants title for the money they're putting in. Only India can give the title. So we have, we have protested. We have not joined the inauguration of the One Belt, One Road initiative. But we have not done anything more than that because the unofficial policy seems to be line of control into the international border. It is with this background that this book has been written. And here I go back to say that you have one state occupied by three sovereign countries, India, Pakistan, China. There's a political stalemate. Indian policymakers focus on the part of the state with India. They tighten the grip by diluting Article 370, the autonomy promised to the state. Because unlike other princely Indian states, Kashmir has never executed an instrument of merger, merging the territory into India. They're entitled to the autonomy as per Indian constitution. But New Delhi seems to have diluted or emasculated that autonomy and of course try to hold the state by force using draconian penal laws resulting in gross human rights violations. It's no secret. But the policy is, at the end of the day, to focus on what is with us. And so the Kashmir issue is characterized as the Kashmir Valley and cross-border terrorism. Kashmir Valley is just 9% of the state. Kashmir issue is not the valley, it's the entire state. northern areas, Azad Kashmir, and so on and so forth. Now, with this political stalemate which continues, we don't really have a solution, and the book discusses the inadequacies of all the solutions, military solution, diplomatic solution, political solution, and so on and so forth, to see will they don't seem to be any solution because it is so multi-layered in the first place. I would go back to the narrative I gave, and for two reasons. One, that if we see that, and people may have different narratives as to what happened on the subcontinent, but I'm choosing this narrative because this is documented by the British themselves, which leads us to believe that the entire subcontinent has been taken for a ride. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, you have created artificial boundaries, mutually hostile nations, heightened sense of nationalism, leading to bloodshed all over. So we demonize Pakistan, Pakistan demonizes India. 
So it's, it's one is to bring that into public domain to say it's high time you stop doing that, to realize you are one people, as Gandhi put it, by partitioning you're cutting a living organism into sm small pieces. Because there is a fusion of Indo-Muslim culture of over 1,100 years, which even the Pakistan foreign minister in his book released in October 2015 mm -hmm. uh, himself documents that you have the same culture, you enjoy the same thing, same music, same clothes. You're one people. So we can draw comparisons with the Middle East, and perhaps in question answer session I'll take that up. But the second point is something I want to make before I conclude is perhaps the way forward on the Kashmir issue is by seeing how we came to the situation in the first place. Very briefly, India may be an ancient civilization, but modern day India and Pakistan are creations of British statutes. And there's no, we could have done away with those statutes, but there is no dispute of a legitimacy of a India and a Pakistan. They're members of the UN. Now, those statutes, if I had pointed out, applied two-nation theory to partition the provinces. But as far as the princely Indian states are concerned, it was the ruler who was sovereign who could come to India, Pakistan, or stay independent. That was the scheme of the act, reflecting the political agreement. If that is the position, then the government of India, as the government of Pakistan, were creations of this constitutional law, the British statutes, and had their powers limited again by these British statutes. If that is a position, then from where did the government of India get the jurisdiction or the competence to lay down a policy contrary to the statutes that once the ruler has unconditionally acceded to India, people will decide whether the state will come to India or Pakistan or stay independent. The wishes of the people were alien to the accession of a princely state. For the other 560-odd princely states, ruler decided regardless of the religious complexion of the people. Two-nation theory is not applicable here. So rather than saying we're not bound by UN resolutions, I would say the UN resolutions are against the UN Charter. New Delhi itself was not competent to say wishes of people are relevant to test an accession, and the United Nations Security Council, United Nations Security Council knew this. If you see the study, you study the resolutions carefully, they say the plebiscite administrator will draw his powers from the rule of the state not from New Delhi, because the ruler had ceded to India in limited areas. He was still sovereign with respect to the other areas. So the basic proposition is that New Delhi had no power to lay down a policy contrary to the constitution that gave it birth. And by the same token, Pakistan is created by the same law. And it is fair to say the law that created Pakistan itself made Kashmir a part of India. Now, if I have a house, and then I say, this is my house, I then create a doubt and say, well, I don't know whether this is my house. Some people get in, I say, please vacate. They say, you don't know your own title. I say this is a terrorist movement. This is a freedom struggle. Till the disputed tag on the title is not removed, there's nothing you can do in that house. And the only body, in, uh, only way of removing the disputed tag is to go to a court. And so, I have suggested in 2001 as part of my doctoral research and in 2016 when the book was released that India must depoliticize the Kashmir issue. Kashmir is a political issue, but it has a legal part attached. It has a legal aspect along with the political part. Separate the legal from the political. Get a finding in law from the ICJ at The Hague, the International Court of Justice at The Hague, 
as to whether India was competent under the law which created India to introduce wishes of the people as a factor to test accession by of a state. Law cannot resolve Kashmir, but law can change the political discourse. Law can give the moral right of a state to assert its presence in a particular state. Should the ICJ says the entire state belongs to India, then you can invoke Namibia's judgment, Nicaragua's judgment, the very presence of China, Pakistan in Kashmir amounts to aggression. The UN mechanisms will come into play. And it will be the first step by which New Delhi can change the polit political discourse and perhaps, and then of course, the more trying part of regaining its moral authority to be in the state because what has happened there, New Delhi has lost its moral authority. So this is one suggestion. New Delhi is not very happy with it because this, they're scared after what happened in 1947-48. They don't want to go to the international stage. But New Delhi has nothing to fear for this very simple reason that even if the ICJ goes against India, which is not likely to happen, but if it does go against India, it will not really, New Delhi won't lose anything before the simple reason. It doesn't mean Kashmir goes to Pakistan. At best, ICJ can say wishes of the people were relevant. New Delhi's stand always has been that while we have not held the plebiscite, we can't because Pakistan is in occupation. We have ascertained the wishes of the people through an elected constituent assembly which has framed a separate constitution for the state, and they want to be with India. So New Delhi can fall back on the existing stand. So this, as far as New Delhi is concerned, there's not much risk, even if it does not succeed in the ICJ. So regardless of the issue of binding nature of ICJ decision, regardless of the issue of international politics and the dynamics of international politics, an authoritative finding by a court as to whether the state belongs to the Indian Union or not can alter the political discourse. And so to break the political stalemate I talked about between India, Pakistan, and China, China, my suggestion is if you don't have a military solution, you don't have a diplomatic solution, use law as a means of breaking the stalemate so as to eventually ignite or start a political process. Now this framework is something which has escaped consideration for the last 70 years. Because out of the 70 years, I've researched on Kashmir for, for 20 years. And I've not come across any consideration of a proposal of depoliticizing Kashmir, as opposed to trying to build a political process in a state which is where violence is endemic, where people are on tranquilizers, where there's a feeling of injustice and gross human violations of all concerned, whether it's security personnel, the civilian population, or even the militants. You can't, in those circumstances, actually start a political process. So I think I'll stop here, 7.36 right now. I would like to give the, have, have time to take questions to be grilled, because there are many layers of Kashmir issue I've not talked about. It's all there in the book, but I would invite uh, questions uh, from the audience. My name is Glenn Totten, and I'm curious in the course of this, having followed some of the problems in Kashmir over time, the Chinese are something, are, are an entity in which most Americans pay no attention to in this particular conflict. How powerful have they become over the last, say, 10 years, given the Silk Road? Well, I think they have actually, they're not dictating the terms as Pakistan is concerned because the OBOR was unveiled earlier this year, and they talk about not only an economic corridor, but laying down optic fibers to uh, throughout Pakistan. It's not just no longer only the occupied territory of Kashmir, by which uh, they will be able to transmit Chinese culture throughout Pakistan. So you have a situation where China is 
is uh, trying to exert its influence, whether through on the waters, whether through the, in the mainland, they want a presence. And so, uh, which has got, of course, other countries, Japan, European Union, US, don't like that. And they're trying to have their own different access. But if the question is how the role of China, I think China, though it has got nothing to do whatsoever with the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Well, to follow that up, if I might just for yes. a point, is that agreed. But would you say now that the Chinese are currently using Pakistan as a ploy to block India's ascension in on the subcontinent? You talked about the crescent and the, the Muslim uh, mm -hmm. role mm -hmm. vis-a-vis. Great Britain, is this a play by China to do somewhat the same thing? Well, I, I, mean, I, w I mean, I won't go that far for the simple reason that I, mean, I find fault with the Indian policymakers because if the policy itself is territorial status quo, okay. then whatever, I mean, New Delhi jumps with joy the minute some country says it's a bilateral issue. Because Without realizing, the minute you say Kashmir is a bilateral issue, you're giving standing to Pakistan other than an aggressor. Okay. So if India stand itself is territorial status quo, even the countries who find it politically expedient to support New Delhi will only endorse India's stand of territorial status quo. So I won't really, uh, I mean, I wouldn't know. To, for, to, I would, it's only a question of speculation. I won't really know whether China has a plan of trying to checkmate India in a corner through this route, as you're suggesting. I would say they don't even need to do that because we ourselves, as far as the government of India is concerned, they don't seem to be too concerned about what's happening. Apart, I mean, we have had, I've quoted that in the book, uh, Indian authorities dismissing Chinese presence in occupied territories as being mere acne, saying that we don't really need to be worried about it. And China saying, well, our building tunnels through Kashmir is giving livelihood to the local people there. So it is treated in a frivolous manner or in a, they trivialize the entire issue. So I don't really think that uh, there's a design behind it. Okay. Um, you mentioned taking this issue to the ICJ. Uh, what makes you think that these three uh, parties would actually accept the decision, especially in the case of, say, Pakistan or China, where it doesn't benefit them? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because that is a common refrain. Well, even if you go to ICJ, you need consent of the parties, A. And even if you get a decision, who's bothered? I mean, you've seen with the arbitration, et cetera, China saying, well, we want to do what we want to do. And I want to answer that question at two levels. One, on the issue of going to the ICJ. Now, China is not actually a party to the Kashmir question or the India-Pakistan question with the United Nations Security Council. We have the Shimla Agreement in place, which says that Kashmir issue will be resolved, or all differences will be resolved bilaterally or through any other peaceful means. Going to a court could be a peaceful mean, number one. The other route could be simply uh, with the United Nations Security Council, under if you see Article 36, Clause 5 of the Charter, itself says whenever there are legal disputes, you must go to the ICJ. India can ask for advisory opinion under the, the, the UN Charter, or the, or the General Assembly can invoke the Uniting for Peace resolution to go to the to ICJ. So getting to the ICJ may not be very difficult. Apart from, of course, the Statute 36, Clause 1. Because now, uh, here I must share with you, when the book was released for the first time in 2016, Pakistan's declaration before the ICJ had not made any reservations submitting to the compulsory jurisdiction of ICJ. India had Commonwealth reservations. So India could choose what it wanted to refer. Pakistan had given its consent. 10 months after this book has been released, Pakistan has revoked a 60-year-old declaration to not put reservations, blocking its, in a way, in a way withdrawing its consent to the compulsory jurisdiction. But India can still invoke 36 laws one way it can to go to the ICJ. But the broader issue is, what if the ICJ gives a decision? At the end of the day, to implement it, you need to go back to the Security Council. And that's a political body. For me, what's important is not the binding nature of that decision, 
For me, what's important is authoritative finding on who has a title so as to get rid of the disputed territory tag. We must understand that countries are not governed by laws, much less in violence. We need public opinion. India has lost out on the public opinion because the world sees India as wriggling out of its promise for plebiscite. You need to build public opinion to say we were not in the wrong. For that, even uh, Namibia, for instance, was an advisory opinion, which actually laid down the legal consequences of a decision of the ICJ. Even if you have advisory opinion, even if it's non-binding, even if it's not enforceable, the fact is a decision by a body whose views are authoritative as far as the UN is concerned is good enough to remove the disputed territory tag and alter the political discourse. Because at the end of the day, law, as I pointed out, law can't resolve Kashmir issue. You can write beautiful judgments. You need to create a will to implement it. So if you have a decision by the judicial organ of the United Nations, that will seep in. New Delhi will be able to stand with credibility before the Kashmiri people and say no injustice has been caused to you. <coughs> New Delhi has no answer when Kashmiris say, well, we are not animals to be given from A to B. You need to be able to put out a case before the international community, before the domestic populace, to say, we made a mistake. And this is the way we want to correct it. So for that, the mere fact you get a decision is good enough. Regardless of whether China or Pakistan accepts it or not. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.